I've had a love affair with M&Ms. They are like <laughs> on my hit list because I've learned through a lot of research I cannot have one, two, three, four, even a normal serving, which whatever that is. In 10th grade, I had joined the ski team in my high school. Now mind you, I've skied a little, but I am not by any means like a pro skier, nor did I care about skiing competitively. But what I did care about was when I found out that to be on the ski team, you had to sell M&Ms. You had to sell, um, <laughs> you got like a case of them, like boxes, not bags, boxes of M&Ms. I just remember walking home and literally, I mean, pouring like one box after the other. I probably went through, oh, I don't know, 16 or 17 boxes. And my walk was, you know, it took probably about 30 minutes. Just the shame and embarrassment. Like I did not know what to say to my parents or to say to the teacher that was heading the ski team. Like I had all these boxes now that were empty and I had no funds. Thinking like, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna, how am I gonna get this money? How am I gonna, like, like a crack addict, like a drug addict, like how am I gonna, this is my drug of choice. How am I gonna finance this? People say you don't have these memories, but I have this memory, I think I was four, where I just was in love with my dad. As a little girl, he was like, just my favorite person on the planet. He would take me every now and then to nursery school, and I remember we stopped at Dunkin' Donuts. I just remember getting these chocolate-covered chocolate donuts with chocolate sprinkles and getting two of them. I mean, I like housed the first one, and I just remember getting a second one, and I was like holding my stuffed little, um, I had an elephant named Ernie, so I was like holding it, sucking my thumb, downing a donut. My dad was with me. It was like, I don't think there could be a better moment in my lifetime. Like, I'm still remembering it, and I'm just filled with like love and gratitude and memories of chocolate donuts. This is, I think, in fifth grade. I was at my friend Nikki Huff's house, and she was not a very big eater. And I remember her mom made like the best grilled cheese. It was in the winter. We had grilled cheese. We had hot chocolate. And before we ate lunch, I was like so hungry, or at least I thought I was hungry. And I remember she like never seemed to be hungry. And I was like, Nikki, aren't you hungry? Like, aren't you ready to eat lunch yet? Like, isn't it time for lunch? Don't you want grilled cheese? Like I would ask people like, oh, don't you want that? And really what I was saying is I want that, but I didn't know how to say that yet. And I just remember eating like her grilled cheese and my grilled cheese and I think her brother's grilled cheese and like got her mom to make us fries. I mean, it was like, who had the best food? It, it usually was an and statement. I loved the person I was hanging out with and did they have good food at their house? I had a friend who did not have good food. So, you know, I just like really didn't want to hang there. That's kind of how I made my decision. <laughs> Any opportunity where there was food, it was like game on. I was keenly aware of what was there. I was keenly aware of how much I was eating, how much was on my plate, how much I thought should be on my plate, how much was on somebody else's plate. I always noticed what you ate. And I felt like, you know, I did a lot of dancing, ballet, tap and jazz. I love dancing, did gymnastics. I was a swimmer. So you can just imagine I was in a swimsuit or a leotard like four days out of the week. I felt bigger. I felt at a place. I still love to dance and I didn't let it stop me and it's funny the teacher would say Julie you have such a big smile so I'm gonna put you in the center and I would think like Miss Susan but why are you putting me in the center I don't look as good as everybody I had already start to feel internally like really not good enough not thin enough not pretty enough not smart enough but not good enough is like that overarching theme my mom who was um, very heavy as a child and then lost weight later I think was very concerned she didn't want me to go through the painful experiences she had so she took me to see a doctor, my general practitioner, who, mind you, is probably close to 400, 450 pounds. And he checked me out. I remember this so vividly. He's looking at me and he's like, well, it's really clear. If Julie just starves herself for two weeks, that's, that's what she needs to do. Forget that he's 400 pounds and probably dealing with his own, you know, emotional eating issues. What came up for me was like, yep, I'm not good enough. Yep, you saw that and you just, you just said that. So it affirmed for me what I was fearing and what I felt. My mom obviously was horrified and like whisked me away. And she was like, that is absurd. We're not doing that. But the damage had been done. And even though I heard somewhere inside, like that's not the answer. I just I gave my power away and bought into this idea that something was wrong with me.
but I remember I had this like new notepad stack, like they had little quotes and things on them. And I remember like thinking I took one of the pieces off and I was like, I'm going to write down and declare who I like. And at that time, I really liked this guy named JP. So I was like, I like JP and he's going to ask me out. And I just wrote down what I wanted to have happen. So I remember asking my friend and neighbor, Josh Sparr, Josh, will you go ask JP what, you, what he thinks of me? But do it in a way where you're like, yeah, what does he think of Laura? What does he think of Amy? What does he think of Rachel? And then like just insert my name so that, you know, I can just kind of, it, it won't be so obvious. I had three of my girlfriends over. We were hanging out in my room. So he came over and I was like, okay, great. Like, tell us what happened. Thinking like, of course he's going to have something nice to say. And uh, <laughs> he like went through the list of everyone and he was like, oh, he, he thinks she's pretty. She's cute. And then he said, my name, he's like, oh, he thinks you're nasty. And um, that was super, super painful. My fear was that guys didn't like me and thought that I, there was like something wrong with me or wasn't pretty. And to hear that word, it was like gut-wrenching. That's when it became like this crutch, sitting in my room, locking my door, listening to you 2 at the time of dating myself. <laughs> and downing whatever I could get my hands on made me feel loved. My first marriage, really great guy, like really great guy. I was good friends with him in college. He was also the first person to say, I love you. And, um, you know, we're not married anymore. He's happily remarried. I'm happily remarried. We actually have two kids together. He's a terrific person. And I really got that that story with JP carried over. I mean, I part of what I think drew me in is that he said he loved me and I did not think I was lovable. You know, in my former marriage, I, the nicest in-laws, they couldn't be nicer. We'd be at these huge dinners. They used to have like 20 people over and I didn't necessarily agree with what they were saying and I wouldn't say anything or I would say like, oh, I agree when I didn't. And then what would end up happening was I like felt as though I just pushed my voice down a little bit more. I kept pushing it down, just half an inch, half an inch, half an inch until finally you know, to my breaking point, it was like, I didn't have one, which did not work. And I can remember I was bringing all the plates in after dinner we were getting dessert ready. And my uh, first husband's mother was like an amazing cook and also baker. She would make like bags and bags of cookies and then freeze them. So I remember just that there was a correlation every time I didn't share how I felt or felt like I didn't have a voice, I would go to the freezer and I am talking like these are frozen cookies. Like you're supposed to take them out, let them thaw. I mean, I don't know how I didn't break a tooth. I would like not eat one, not eat two. I would take little pieces one at a time. I would put them in my pocket. I'd go to the bathroom. Um, oh my God, I remember. To <laughs> so I just remembered I took a whole <laughs> How I did this, I was really good. I was really good because no one saw me. I took an entire freezer bag of cookies into the bathroom, which is so gross. And um, I just, I mean, I didn't go to the bathroom. I just sat on the, the toilet on top of the seat and I was like downing these cookies. Like I, that is what gave me relief. That's where I went to find my comfort. My voice um, was in a bag in the freezer. I'll never forget this see M&Ms come back into my life again. <laughs> I was in a job that we had bagels all the time, always an event with a lot of food, a lot of focus on food. And we had this event and there were all these M&Ms left over, but they weren't just M&Ms, they were tie-dye M&Ms. And you could only get them at Costco. And I'm sitting in my office. <laughs> it's a Thursday afternoon, so one more day and it's the weekend. And there is a five pound bag of tie-dyed M&Ms with probably four pounds left. I remember so manipulatively like thinking to myself, oh, cool. Well, I'll just have like a Dixie cup of M&Ms. They're tie-dye M&Ms. Where do you find tie-dye M&Ms? It's so cool. I'm a hippie at heart. Like, I mean, every crazy thought was going through my head to make it okay that I was going to have these M&Ms. And I really tr believed that I was going to have one cup. So I had one cup and then I was like, well, there's such small cups. I'm going to have another cup it's fine. I'll have another cup. They're tiny. Like it's fine. I kept looking in the bag. It seemed like it was an endless bag, like the Mary Poppins bag. It just kept, it just kept being filled with M&Ms. So I kept going in and going in the next thing I know. Oh my God. I actually lost count. I think, I think it was about 40. 
it became, I remember thinking, I feel like a robot. It was like this, and I would eat them. It was like this, and then I would eat them. I could not stop. Finally, I got to the point where I was actually nauseous, and I ran to the bathroom, and I threw up. I mean, I'd eaten that many M&Ms, and I ended up going home. It was time to go home. And I remember saying to my husband at the time, like, I think something's wrong, thinking I just don't want to live anymore. Like, I don't want to be in this life. I can't handle this. I remember calling a family friend who was a therapist, and I loved her, and I felt really comfortable with her. She recommended um, going to a support group. The first meeting I went to, no one stayed around to talk to me. And I remember crying and thinking to myself, like, Julie, if you get into your car right now, like, I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's not a good idea. Like, you have what it takes to be brave enough and courageous enough to go back in there and get one number, just one number even. And that was like the beginning of when I started to listen to my inner voice. I remember bawling and like turning around. I didn't even know who I was angry with, but I was like angry and sad and desperate. And there was a woman there and she was awesome. I just remember feeling like I was coming home, like to hear other people share authentically and share, like really share what similar stories of things they've done with food and in life that I had done. It was like the beginning of the end of shame and vulnerability running my life. For me, one of the biggest gifts was learning how to sit with my emotions, learning how to be with anger, with grief, with sadness, with frustration, with disappointment. These are all part of the tapestry of human emotions. And, you know, it was through these different support group meetings, through learning to meditate, to sit, to breathe, just to come back to my breath, journaling, being able to free flow and write out what I was thinking and feeling and letting my thoughts go. For anyone who's met my mom, so growing up, she used to have me look in the mirror, like hug myself, like Stuart Smalley on Saturday Night Live. And she would say, like, Julie, look in the mirror and say, I love you, you're beautiful, you're good enough. <laughs> I used to add, like, gosh darn it, people love me. I've created this little game with myself whenever I look in the mirror, because it was the opposite of what I used to do. I used to look in the mirror and be like, ugh, like, I didn't want to look in the mirror. I mean, it used to be painful to look in the mirror. And so one of the things I started to do baby steps wise was just to look in the mirror and say, I love you. I love you because you were born and because you're here on this planet and I love you. And I just started really small. I love you, Julie. Something else that really, really impacted me and I remember it was New Year's, the first year that I was in the support group, and a really dear friend of mine was having a vision board party. Game changer. I can't explain it, but there was something so profound about doing that vision board and then looking at it day after day and just taking in like these words that, I, that, that resonated for me. And most of these words were not words that I had been using in, in the days and, and weeks and years before. And feeling like it opened the door to my you know, my higher self, my soul, my divinely connected part of me that had just been somewhat stuffed down or asleep. It was like shedding light and giving her a space to play. And what was so cool is that most of what happened on that board started to come to fruition. I mean, it's just amazing how this happens. Ended up, this is so ironic, working for a very well-known national uh, restaurant chain. And I just knew I got this like inner knowing I was supposed to work there. And I was kind of like, are you kidding? Like, universe, higher power, God, are you kidding? I'm gonna work in this restaurant chain that has a bakery and I have to train and learn how to bake everything, like three nights of overnight baking. And I'm now learning that flour and sugar don't really work well for my body. And what? Being in that, that bakery feeling like, what am I gonna do? I can't have one cookie. I'm not somebody who's, who's designed that way. I can't do that, it doesn't work for me. And I remember my vision board, like something on that vision board was all around peace. And something came over me that said, Julie, like you really want inner peace and you are learning to love yourself and eating those things are not gonna give you that. It's not that it's wrong to eat them, it's just it's not gonna give you that. It was like, I don't know how to explain it. It was like my dialogue internally started to shift. And, you know, today I coach people. I've made my living out of coaching and teaching and speaking to people. And 
I always look first. We look at what are you saying to yourself? What is that internal dialogue? Because I believe the stories we say to ourselves, the words we use, they're generative, they're meaningful, they make a difference. They can shift an entire experience from, you know, the past I would have eaten probably, God knows, I mean, I don't know, maybe like 15, <laughs> 20 cookies, I don't know. I don't know, I don't wanna have a competition because like whatever you think you could eat, I could probably eat more of those. <laughs> Ironically, this past week leading up to this filming has been like, food has been so loud. Let me tell you something, I was like this close to going to a supermarket. I mean, when I tell you I wanted to eat something like get a box of Oreos, what was calling my name. And I ended up calling a very dear friend of mine and I'm so thankful she picked up the phone and she's like, what do you think it's about? And I realized, I know what it's about. I'm sharing, like I'm bearing it all. I'm sharing it. Like it's almost harder to do this, I think, than maybe a nude scene. Although I'm not ready to do a nude scene, so that's not happening. Wanting to use food to handle emotions can still come up. And I just wanted you to know that um, it has especially come up in filming this and that um, that's okay. That's, that tells me that I am sharing something that is worthwhile, that I'm building my courageous muscle and that, um, that I'm in a place where I can talk about it, where I am not in the dark. And that's why I wanted to do Hungry For More. It's about you know really looking to see what is it you want in this lifetime? We all have a beautiful shot, a long one, really, if you think about it. And um, for me, you know, it's about making a difference with others. And um, I'm grateful, hopefully I can do that today. I'm grateful, hopefully I can do that for you.